everyone. We're back with another episode of Fertility.SunCensored. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Abby Evelyn from National Fertility Center. And today I'm joined by my excellent and extraordinary co-host, Dr. Susan Hudson from Texas Fertility Center. Hello. And Dr. Carrie Bedient from the Fertility Center of Las Vegas. Hey. <laughs> Hi, guys. <laughs> So we were just talking before everything started and Carrie had this birthday hat on, which made us kind of suspicious that it's <laughs> birthday time. And so she, and I, I kind of thought that there was kind of a important birthday that's kind of coming up soon. And so then when we asked her, she's like, yeah, I've got a birthday on Thursday. So, so Carrie, for our YouTube listeners or watchers, can you put on this birthday hat so they know yeah. what we're talking oh, yeah. about? Let's see. To be fair, I have this hat because <laughs> um, we were doing a Zoom for one of my girlfriend's birthdays. And so her husband sent it, all three of us these hats ahead of time. And so we all got our cupcake and our hat on so that when Aww. she walked on, she saw us. But give me just a minute. Let me grab it. Well, if only Carrie had told us, Susan, we could have worn some special party hats today, too, if we'd I only know. know. Ta da! <laughs> <laughs> Observe my Love. candles. Yep, like Cute. it, like it. So, Very good. Um, so any special plans that you're aware of for this important birthday? So my husband is plotting something, yeah. but he won't tell me what it is. And I told him like, because I, I threw him a huge party for his 40th, which was over Memorial Day. And so ah. when, when we were talking about that, he was like, okay, well, I need to start planning yours. And I'm like, no, I, some other year, I can't handle it this too, this year. There has been too much stuff going on. And I just, not, not this year, some other yeah. time I would love it. Not this year. And so he's like, okay. So starting about two, three weeks ago, he keeps dropping hints of, okay, well, you know, when are you going to get out of work that day? And I, I had previously arranged for our kids to hang out with one of their pseudo grandmas that, that evening. And so, so the kids are otherwise engaged. And he's like, okay, well, what about, you know, what have you done for this? And what about that? And what about this? And don't make any plans and don't do anything and don't, don't do this and don't do that. And don't pick up my phone and don't look at any of my text messages. <laughs> not so that something's I, cooking. Yeah. Like, not that I look at his phone, but you know, we trade phones back and forth all the time if we're looking up whatever. And so he's like, do not log into my phone. And so <laughs> I'm dying to know. So, you know, for anybody else, Carrie, it'd be like, cool, if you got on a plane and went to like Las Vegas or somewhere like that, you know, but, <laughs> but not you. <laughs> I would, I would rather get on a plane and go to the middle of nowhere. That, <laughs> that would be highly appealing for me or drive the two hours into oh. St. George or to Zion National Park or Big Bear, like someplace where I can just disappear so you, into nothing. Travel involved, you think? Or like, could it be a weekend or a few day thing? Or I don't know. I asked him like, okay, so what do I need to wear that day? And he's like, I'm not telling you until it's time. Oh. Like, Ooh. Well, so from, that, from, that's what from one of my husband's big birthdays, I, and I pulled it off pretty well up until like the day before we ended up going to Mexico to a, an all-inclusive, which was great because it was great for him and for me. <laughs> it was a yeah. surprise, surprise for him, but fun for both of us. So maybe yeah. you've got something like that pl planned and you don't know it. I mean, at most it could be overnight because, you know, children, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I'm dying to know what it is because well, you're going to have to let us know. Oh, I know. To be continued. Yeah. We'll have to have to figure that out. Yeah. So anyway, take my little candles off. <laughs> so we were also talking and I've had a few patients recently and the it seems that the things that Wait. I'm worried about. Abby, oh, let's do a question real quick. Oh, sorry. Question of the day. Okay. I'm getting jumping question. ahead here. Yes. Question of the day, Susan. What have we got? All right. I've just discovered your podcast and I'm going through previous episodes. So if you've already answered, I'm sure I'll find out. But if you haven't, I'm 45, have two children, one at 37, one at 39. I want, uh, might've had more, but had breast cancer at age 41. Um, did go through lumpectomy chemo with AC and Taxol and radiation. So, um, essentially she, she wants to know, um, do I have to go off the tamoxifen to retrieve eggs? How long do I have to be off the tamoxifen? Does AC Taxol cause any problems with egg health? Thank you. And a big thank you to the three of you for doing this podcast. Your camar camaraderie makes me happy and your informative discussions are very helpful. Thank you so much for that. That's very sweet. Oh, warm and fuzzies. 
So two halves of this question. The first is um, about tamoxifen and the second is about AC taxol. And we'll, we'll tackle the really low hanging fruit first of yes, AC taxols got, got an impact on eggs. It's not necessarily as awful as some of the other ones, um, but it's, it's got a real effect. And one of the things that we often see with chemo agents is that the effect that they have depends on the status of the woman when she gets it. So for example, I, I have a 15 year old patient right now that I just got from eggs from a couple days ago. And she, she is about to go into chemo because she is very young, because her egg supply is really at the very beginning of it. She's going to get this chemo and there's a pretty decent likelihood that mm -hmm. she'll still have periods after it. And she may have good enough eggs to get pregnant on her own. Her reproductive lifespan is going to be shorter and end at an earlier point than if she never got the chemo. But most likely she's she's going to have some recovery afterwards. That's very different than a woman who gets it around the age of 40, give or take a couple of years in either direction, because her ovarian supply is already depleted by normal aging. And those eggs are already impacted with chromosomal abnormalities by normal aging. So when you add in the chemotherapy to that, um, it it's a much tougher position to get out of. And generally most people kind of want you off chemotherapy for six to 12 months before they retrieve eggs because it almost damages the group of eggs that you have at the time. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of another factor co to consider. So um, I think probably, she had her chemo probably when she was at 41. So it's probably about four years ago. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Far okay. From that. yeah. But the other part of the conversation is the likelihood of being successful with IVF at the age of 45, just baseline without the history of chemo and then plus the history of chemo is that I, this is kind of one of those, I never say never because I've seen never happen, <laughs> but yes. the, the chances of getting viable eggs to create viable embryos at 45, especially with a history of chemotherapy is going to be very, very, very low. Yeah. Yeah. I had a patient recently that kind of illustrated that she was in her 43, 44 age range and had a really good egg number and made a bunch of eggs and had like eight or 10 to be tested. None of them were normal. So that's, there's a point where the age kind of counterbalances, even if you have a great AMH, there's a point where mm -hmm. your body just doesn't make normal eggs anymore. Absolutely. Yeah. And then the other part of this question is, what do you do about tamoxifen? Um, tamoxifen is actually structurally very similar to Clomid, which is a medication we use for ovulation induction pretty frequently. Um, and then there's a, a sister medication, letrozole, which is an aromatase inhibitor. And that one is a, is a very useful medication for keeping your estrogen levels low. So I don't know that you necessarily have to go, go off of it. Your local REI is probably going to have an opinion of what they like to do. Um, they may have you come off the tamoxifen and put you on letrozole instead temporarily. They may have you keep the tamoxifen going. Um, it just, it kind of depends on what their preference is, but, but there's a couple ways you can approach that depending on what, uh, what the big picture looks like. Mm -hmm. All right. So now to our topic of the day, you guys keep me straight. Thanks. So our topic of the day is going to be things that you should worry about, um, when you're trying to get pregnant, because it's interesting. I think sometimes the things we as physicians worry about, sometimes patients don't really see those as being that big of a deal. And then things they worry about, sometimes we don't really see as being that big of a deal. So we're going to do a couple of episodes, but the, this episode is going to be about things that you should worry about when you're about to try and get pregnant. And so, I have to say that I love this because when I do my initial histories, there's different parts of my history questionnaire that I make sure things match up. So like do your surgeries in your past medical history, in your current medications, do they match up? <laughs> because, you know, sometimes I'll have, they had surgery for breast cancer, but I have nothing under past medical history of breast cancer <laughs> or yeah. whatever yeah. cancer it may have been. So yes. obviously my thing on this one is if you have had any type of cancer at any point in your life, whether it was childhood or adult, your doctor needs to know. <laughs> Similarly, <Absolutely. laughs> any procedure, even if it's not related to your reproductive organs, 
we got to know about that because the can you first- give some examples, Carrie? Yeah. So there's the one related to reproductive organs that I swear I get blindsided by at least twice a year, which is I'll go through a guy's history. He will give me absolutely negative on everything. (laughs) And then we'll go into discussion of labs and I'll say, we're going to get a semen analysis. And he goes, oh, I had a vasectomy. I had a vasectomy. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Oh, by the way. Well, And and occasionally that can happen with the tubal ligation too. Same thing. You'll forget to put that in and you go to the end and you're like, well, you know, let's do oh, well, I had, you know, I had that tubal ligation at the same time that I had the last C-section. It's like, no, I didn't know that. Yeah. The the thought that goes through my head is you should have led with that. Um, Yeah. So, so that's the reproductive related one, the non-reproductive related ones. So there's the simple, as simple as I had a breast augmentation and we always ask like, how did it go? part of what we're asking for that is, did you have any post-op complications? Because if you started throwing blood clots post-operatively, we want to know about it. Did you react to anesthesia? Started bleeding or, or started or bleeding. bleeding? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. did you bleed too much or too little? We want to know about it because we're going to go poking and we need to know that. Um, similarly, did you react poorly to anesthesia? Because if you are not a good anesthesia risk for some reason, we're going to behave differently and make different plans. Um, for someone who had, let's say, bowel surgery, that's going to leave a lot of scar tissue in your belly. And because no, all that bowel sits down on your reproductive organs. Mm-hmm. And and that may impact what we are able to see. And when we go in to do surgery, whatever it may be, may impact the ease and the risk of complications. So we want to know all that stuff. We are not just focusing yeah. on the, oh. the square foot of your genital region like we want to know all of it or even if you had an appendicitis when you were 15 particularly if it was ruptured that's huge because your tubes could be blocked so yeah yeah, all those things and even maybe you've had a colonoscopy because you have a family history of colon cancer at early ages or things like this those things single signal to us hey maybe this person needs spec special genetic testing Mm -hmm. for different inherited conditions that we, if you chose, could potentially help minimize the risk of in your children. Yeah. And when we're asking about family history, same, same things apply. We are not just asking about their reproductive organs. We are asking about who had cancer, who has autoimmune conditions, who has diabetes, high blood pressure, who has problems that started when they were 25, 30 years old. Like, We're asking all of those because they may help us clue into genetic issues we need to talk to you about, extra testing we want to do, a genetic counselor that we're going to send you to, or or even just general risks that can impact your ability to get pregnant, be pregnant, all the things. And I seem to find that people who have had conditions for a long period of time seem to be less concerned about them. So like Mm -hmm. diabetes for us is kind of a big deal. We want to make sure your hemoglobin A1C is under a certain number because we know that the baby could have genetic complications that it wouldn't have if your blood sugar was under good control. And so it's funny how people, and I get it, you know, you've had it for a long time and you've dealt with it for a long time and it's just you, but you know, we say, I'm sorry, you can't get pregnant until your hemoglobin A1C is whatever number it is under six or whatever. A lot of times people get really upset about that. And it's not that we're trying to be punitive. It's just, we know that you're going to have a healthier baby if it's under a certain number. Um, same thing goes for high blood pressure. I had a couple of people in the last few weeks that have had high blood pressure. And I don't know, sometimes I think people are a little bit in denial. They always blame us doctors. They always say, oh, it's just when I come to your office, my blood pressure is 160 over 100. And so, yeah, I mean, there is such a thing as white coat syndrome. That's true. Anytime you're stressed, your blood pressure can go up a little bit, but a little bit is like, 130 over 90, but not like 160 over 110. And if repetitively we see that it's elevated, you know, that's a problem because we want you to have a healthy pregnancy. And and not only that, when we're trying to get you pregnant, your estrogen levels are elevated. Um, and all those things can work together to cause some really bad things to happen in you. So, so those chronic medical conditions. And then the final one that I seem to see a lot of people just kind of blow over is pulmonary emboli. I've had quite a few people that have had clots in their legs, clots in their lungs. And they're like, I'm fine. They gave me a little bit of blood thinner for a while, but I'm fine now. That is a big deal. That's huge. So we really need to know about that because we got to figure out if you need to be on more blood thinner or, you know, if it's safe for you to even get pregnant, that sort of thing. 
Now, other things that we're, we're going to ask and, you know, they may, may feel a little uncomfortable is, you know, telling us about if you've been to other reproductive endocrinologists, because I know sometimes people feel really, you know, it's like, Ooh, I'm, I'm getting a second opinion or, you know, something like that. <laughs> yeah. Like it, it's very, very helpful for us to know on the outset, if where you've been, who you saw, because first of all, we're in a very small world. There are only about like 35 to 40 new reproductive endocrinologists in the entire United States every year. So it, we're a pretty small group. So there's sometimes things we know about different practices that we're like, oh, well, this person kind of practices this way. So, mm-hmm. you know, it kind of leads us down a path. Um, but having those records of what you've had done, not necessarily, I mean, the clinic notes are fine, but I'm talking about your HSG report, your semen analysis report, yeah. your lab reports, your carrier mm-hmm. screening reports. Like we don't mm-hmm. want to reinvent vent the wheel. We right. want to get you from point A to point Z. And that's having a baby safely, quickly, and efficaciously. And if we have that stuff, because you happen to already be somewhere, like we're not going to see it as like a, like, it's not something negative to get a second opinion. Okay. Yeah. A lot of times it's, it's a very healthy response to, Ooh, I've got a major life decision to make here. So that's okay. Yeah. But, but bring the stuff with you because we want to make things easier for you in the long term. And I mean, Lord knows nobody wants to have two HSGs. Well, and just as a side note too, what I find a lot of times all patients will come to the office and they'll be like, Oh, well, I was at this other doctor's office and, but you should have all that information now. And a lot of times we don't have that information. And so it's kind of one of those things. They say they sent it. We say we didn't get it. So really, if you really want to make sure we have it, bring it with you or bring even better, bring it ahead of time so that we'll have time to look at it ahead of time too. Mm -hmm. Have all of your medications available. And the biggest thing that I notice, like usually the people who are taking medications, you jog their memory and they'll go, oh yeah, I'm on whatever. And it's very helpful if you can know the name of the medication. So for example, the high blood pressure. Don't tell us the little green pill. Cause yeah, we don't know what the little the green pill is. I this little white pill that. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we don't, don't know, know what they look like. We need the name. <laughs> um, but things like, you know, high blood pressure medications, they are not all created equal. Some of them have real important fertility yeah. or pregnancy impacts. So we want to know the name. The other thing is when your doctor has prescribed something that you should be taking, or they think you're taking, but you have decided for whatever reason that you are not (laughs) taking. We want to know about those too, because- And why? And why? And why? Because if you are supposed to be taking something, you know, let's go back to blood pressure and you're like, it makes me feel terrible. I hate it. Like I'm willing to take the med. I just, I don't want that particular one because I feel awful. Like that's important for us to know because we can say, oh, well, we're going to get you pregnant anyway. You need to switch over to this. And so we can kill two birds with one stone, get the condition managed and get you in a good place for pregnancy uh, with meds that are not problematic. But the people who say, oh no, I'm totally healthy and who overlook the fact that another physician prescribed a medication, most docs don't prescribe just for funsies to use the prescription pad they're they're doing it because they think there's an actual need for it and that's that's important to communicate to us because we may act differently with that information and to that end if you've had some sort of infectious disease that you know you've had a lot of times when we do our testing we'll look for things like hepatitis and hiv and those sorts of con- conditions and yeah. And it, it and it's probably good to let us know on the front end, because I tell you, it's not an easy conversation for any of us to have when we call somebody up and go, hey, um, looks like you might have syphilis or it looks like you've got hepatitis C. And, you know, some people really panic. And so, you know, we don't know what we're getting ourselves into when we make that phone call. So it makes it easier for everybody if you're just upfront about that and let us know that you've had that exposure in that way you know, we can have the conversation, you know, if it hasn't fully been treated, but otherwise it may just be a remnant of, we see that you've had it before, but if we know you've been treated, it's a different story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about the autoimmune autoimmune conditions, Susan? A lot of those play heavily into what we do. They do. They do. So if you've got things like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, celiac, Sjogren's, you know, what, 
or, or I think, I think these as well as kind of, um, I see this a lot with people who have neurologic disorders too. Like we want to have these under the best control possible. That's right. And, and what I often see in my practice is I know how I have this disease. I'm doing okay with it, but I haven't been to see a doctor in usually three to five years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And getting in to see somebody like a rheumatologist or a neurologist usually is going to take you three to six months to get in. Mm-hmm. And so if you're thinking I need fertility care and you're making that reproductive endocrinologist appointment, make that appointment with a rheumatologist or a neurologist, whatever, you know, whatever your condition is, or if you have a heart condition, you know, if you have a major chronic condition that you typically should see a specialist for that you may not be because you're relatively young and healthy, except for this, and you've been getting by. Okay. We are going to want to know from that type of specialist, are you truly under control? Um, I see this, especially with, um, like ulcerative colitis Mm -hmm. and Crohn's disease. I'll have people who are like, Oh, I'm doing fine. I send them to the GI doctor and it's like, oh, they're regularly having bowel movements with blood in them. And this symptom and that symptom needs to get this under control. Where if you, if, if you know that we are going to want your health in the best condition it can be in going into pregnancy, be proactive, get those other specialist appointments lined up because hopefully they're going to be like, Ooh, you look great go have a baby. Okay. And that's what we want to hear. But if not, we're already on the path of getting you where you need to be. The two questions to ask at those visits, whether you've seen us or not, the things that we are going to want to know one, are you well-managed? Are you stable? Do you need Mm -hmm. anything else to be considered totally under control tests, meds, labs, whatever. The second to ask your doc is tell them straight up, I am actively trying to get pregnant. Is there anything that I need to do differently either while I'm trying to get pregnant or once I am, am, once I am pregnant. And I'm going to interrupt real quick. Yeah. If I I'm a huge proponent of get on whatever you're going to be when you're pregnant now, because post ovulation, I consider you pregnant until proven otherwise. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. And, and have those people write that information down in their (laughs) note, because one of the first things that I'm going to do with someone who I see like, Oh, that's a big medical condition. I am going to request the record. And when they already have it written in their note, that gives me concrete information to go off of so that I can just make my plans with you. And I don't have to track down this other doc to call them, to ask them, you don't have to track them down. Um, because if in doubt, I'm going to send you back to them because your health is important. And so that, that speeds things along. So if you can get those appointments ahead of time and ask the questions of, am I under good control and what do I need to do when I'm pregnant? It's huge. It's helpful. And it will speed your life up. That's a great point. And I have a couple of the idea or a couple of people I can think of in the last few months, the same thing. They're like, well, do you think my rheumatoid arthritis, do you think we can go ahead and get going? I'm like, I don't know. I'm not a rheumatologist. You know, my, my job is to be sort of the quarterback to make sure everything goes the way it sh- should. But like Carrie said, we really need the approval of the person who's treating you so that we know that, yeah, you're healthy and it's safe for you to get pregnant and you're stable right now. We can't make that call. All we can do is ask for that information. And if you've done it on the front end, like Susan said, that makes a huge difference in terms of speeding things up and, and getting going quicker. Any other last thoughts? Because I have one more thing. The things that are the other two things that are important to me. One is that you have the right vaccines. That you've had your rubella vaccine and had your rubella vaccine. Uh, it amazes me the number of people that sign waivers that say, "Oh, I know I'm not immune, but I'm okay. I just want to go ahead and get pregnant." And the reason we're concerned about that is it can be teratogenic. If you get, you can baby can have malformations early in pregnancy, particularly if you get chicken pox or you get rubella early in the first trimester. Generally now, most people say you need to wait a month after you had the vaccine. So it's really minimal wait time. And I think in the long run, you know, we have to help you see the forest for the trees. In the long run, I think it's better for you to get vaccinated, wait an additional month and and know that you have that safety. And then I'm going to add something. I'm going to add something to that, Abby, is realize that when you are pregnant, you are in an immunocompromised state. So you are, and that's because that's how your baby, how 
you know, you're made so that you can grow another living being within you. So you don't reject the baby. Okay. So your immune system is more suppressed. So you can't fight off things that you would normally fight off. So you're more likely to get weird things like chicken pox and rubella. And the other thing is chicken pox and rubella are childhood illnesses. And what we mean by that is that if you contract them during childhood, most, not all children are going to be okay. If you contract them as an adult, especially chicken pox, it can be fatal. Like mm, people can. die of getting chicken pox as an adult. You can get encephalitis. You can have permanent neurologic injury besides the fact that you can cause harm to your baby. So, um, you know, we, I know, we all know you don't want to wait another month or two to, to get pregnant, but we also don't want you to live with a lifetime of regret. And then one last thing, one plug, carrier screening. I, I'm surprised again and again, the number of people that don't want to do carrier screening because you know that's where we look to see if you carry some genetic abnormality. We also look to see if your partner carries the same genetic abnormality. And while it doesn't affect most people, if you're the one in 550 couple that it impacts, it's huge. You know, If I told you you had you know one in four chance of having a baby with spinal muscular atrophy, you'd probably want to know that. And so- I, I think doing expanded care screening is really important. I really try and kind of push my patients to do that. Um, but, you know, not everybody feels that same way, but I think those are, that's a really important thing as well. And part of the reason why we push, uh, push for people to do that carrier screening is because all of us as physicians um, have seen the impact that it has on people's lives. This is not just that your child will be born with a devastating disease. It's that families that have children with chronic severe, severe chronic medical conditions are hugely impacted on marriages and stability. Divorce rates really high. They're impacted financially because of all the medical care that happens. Um, careers are impacted, uh, relationships with other, other members of the family. Like it has very far reaching consequences. And so whatever your decision about what your carrier screening result is, we don't really care about that so much as making sure that you have the information going into it so that whatever decision you're making is the correct one for you. And, and the other thing to know is that even if you test positive for carrier screening, that doesn't mean you can't have babies. Okay. Right. It means you yeah. need to have another conversation with your doctor. And sometimes that will be a conversation of we should do additional testing. And sometimes it's information for you just to make plans. I mean, if say, say you and your partner are carriers for cystic fibrosis. Okay. And you decide, you decide to roll the dice and that is something your RE is comfortable with. Some REs will be comfortable with that. Some REs will not be comfortable with that. Okay. So you have to understand that we also have a, a personal choice in this. Okay. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to where you're going to deliver, what level nursery is going to be at that hospital, who's going to be the pediatrician, what other subspecialists do you need to have lined up for your baby to have established like right away? It can make a difference on what type of place your baby is going to be after you get home. You know, if, if you're a, a, an individual who you're going to have a certain person or a certain daycare or whatever, all of those things can um, be greatly affected. So it, it's one of those that knowledge is power. We are right. not telling you what you have to do with that knowledge, but there, there is power in, in having that piece of information. Very much so. Well said. Well, this was a good episode. I think we all like we're on our bandwagons about each of our things. So this is kind of <laughs> cool. I liked it. Hope our audience liked it. Um, <laughs> so to our audience, thanks for listening and tune in next week for more. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review for Apple Podcasts. We'd really love to hear from you. We're also on Instagram. We're on Facebook. We're on YouTube. Um, so be sure to follow and subscribe and stay updated on all things infertility related. You can also visit us at fertilitydocsuncensored.com to submit your specific questions and we'll answer them anonymously on our Ask the Docs episodes. Um, so don't hold back. We love episode ideas. Um, we want to know what you're thinking and what you want to hear about. As always, this podcast is intended for entertainment and is not a substitute for medical advice from your own physician. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Everybody. Bye.